we've done here is different to conservation principles elsewhere. The idea behind this project is now becoming well known as rewilding. The idea is you allow these natural processes as far as possible to happen. Instead of conserving with specific species in mind where you're focusing on keeping a habitat, locking it down as it is, so that that preserves the numbers of a certain species. What we've done here is just taken our hands off the steering wheel and just stood back and let nature take over. And of course you then get wonderful things happening. We've got nightingales, turtle doves. Barbastel bat, probably Europe's rarest mammal, is starting to fly over this site. In one cow pat alone, a student found 26 different species of beetle. In a single morning, we counted last year 87 male purple emperors, and uh, that's exceptional for, for, for anywhere, really. All five uh, owl species here. A much more hands-off approach actually does deliver you the conservation benefits uh, that you may predict, but also conservation benefits that you wouldn't have dreamed of. What we're learning here, I think, is a future for conservation in the UK. The Burrells uh, built the castle in the middle of this bit of country in 1802, and we've been there ever since, so about 220 years. When I took over running the estate age 21, we started to commercialise our farming operations using sprays and chemicals and, and fertilisers just like everyone else. So it became a very conventional farm. All the fields, as far as the eye can see, would have been intensive farming. It would have been maize, barley, wheat and dairy cows. So for 15 years or more, we did everything a farmer is supposed to do. The difficulty with the land here is that it's 320 metres of wheeled clay and this clay cap sits over a bedrock of ironstone. So it's incredibly difficult farming land. The margins just weren't there to ever make a profit. So over a 20 year period, we just were not making money. And with the intensification of farming and widespread use of pesticides, you've seen a complete collapse in, in wildlife. Um, and that's across the board, so that's butterflies, moths, invertebrates of every description. Some species have suffered cataclysmic declines, so you get nightingales, turtle doves that have suffered more than 95% loss. But across Britain, we're missing this massive biomass in the skies. So in the mid-90s, we decided to make a change. When you're going to make big changes, you might as well follow your heart. Conservation was something that we were really very interested in. We could do something with the land for once, rather than fight against it all the time. We were visiting some sites in, in Holland to have a look at what was going on in Europe in terms of nature and conservation. I came across this uh, Dutchman called Franz Vera. What Franz has shown is that this idea we have in our heads that temperate zone Europe before man began impacting it was closed canopy forest. A squirrel could have run from John O'Groats to Land's End on the treetops without touching the ground is really something from Grimm's fairy tales. It doesn't fit with the ecological reality. Actually, our landscape would have looked a lot more like Africa. It would have been a kind of wood pasture where you would have had groves of trees, open savanna, a much more complicated mosaic habitat. So it's these the ideas behind uh, rewilding. This little part of the countryside is becoming um, more akin to the way that it was before agriculture became really intensified. So at NET what we're doing is we're putting more emphasis on, on natural processes. So we're letting nature take the driving seat. And an important part of that is the grazing animals that are um, within the project. And what these are doing are, are really being kind of proxies for animals that would have been present in huge numbers in our landscape in the distant past. So you have to use domesticated versions because a lot of these animals are actually extinct. So the reason we have longhorn cattle is that they are representing the wild cattle of Europe. The horses, the Exmoor ponies, well they are probably as close as you're going to get to a wild animal anyway. And then you've got the Tamworth pig, which is representing the wild boar. And then you have your deer, so your deer species obviously are wild animals anyway. So these animals that are roaming free over this land, they have a choice of where to go, what to eat, when to eat it. And we don't supplementary feed, so they're not fed on grain. They're all as natural as you can be. So they've got to survive out here throughout the summer and the winter. So that's one of the real key things. 
What these are doing are roaming about the landscape and they are grazing in ways that stimulate different types of vegetation. So you get a very complex system that's ever shifting with this different suite of animals in the landscape. Pigs do something called rootling, uh, so they're using their snout uh, in the soil, they're kind of ploughing along, they're looking for roots and tubers and other tasty things under the soil. And whilst they're doing that, they're turning over the soil, they're kind of resetting the land for us. Cows are, are grazing, but they're also browsing, so they have their long tongues that they uh, wrap around tall grass to, to uh, rip it off and eat it. Uh, but they also rub their horns uh, or their bottoms up against things and um, almost have like a, a coppicing or pollarding effect so you get all sorts of interesting regrowth. The idea is if you've got these animals present in this landscape, what will come? What, what, will, they, what will they drive in habitat um, creation? You're just seeing what happens and not trying to second guess. It was absolutely extraordinary. That first year I can remember walking out of the door and walking through wildflowers, knee-high wildflowers, and then this incredible sound of insects. We hadn't known that that's what we'd been missing. And then, of course, the insects came back, you get the birds coming back, and it seemed to be something really interesting here. These things happening to us in front of our windows, the grazing animals wandering past, it felt very like uh, bits of Africa with these animals moving across the landscape. The effect of rewilding on wildlife here has just uh, been astounding. We're monitoring what's happening here uh, as far as the species are concerned, how they're reacting to this moving away from being in an intensive farm through to this rewilding project. Wildlife has been really quick to recover. All the scrub that's come up has just provided like a pop-up habitat for a, a lot of species and the tall vegetation is fantastic for insects as well. So if you've got the insects, you've got the smaller birds and then you've got the big birds of prey. So you've got a whole working ecosystem here. Little owls are thriving here because uh, we're not putting any pesticides down, no ivermectins in the cows. So that means that cow pats are full of insects and it just makes you realise um, how special this landscape is because of that and it's what's missing in the rest of our countryside. We've also found that um, nightingales, a very uncommon species which is in decline across Britain. The population here has gone up from nine territories ten years ago to 31 territories now. I don't think there's been an increase like that anywhere else in Britain. Things like the green veined white, uh, the small skipper, the Essex skipper, they have shown very, very, very large and rapid increases. Just small skipper, I counted 960. That's an increase of over 1100% on last year. And last year was a good year in itself. Perhaps the most exciting story for uh, butterfly fanatics and wildlife watchers in general uh, here on the wildland is the story of the, the Purple Emperor, which is Britain's largest or one of the largest, most spectacular and sought after species. It's a, a beautiful iridescent purple, the male. It's an aggressive butterfly. It will actually go and chase birds. In a single morning, we counted last year, 87 male purple emperors. And uh, that's exceptional for anywhere, really. Butterflies are very sensitive environmental indicators. So if the butterfly populations are healthy and strong and diverse, then that generally is a, a sign that everything else is as well with the landscape and all of the other flora and fauna. We've had nesting peregrine falcons here. We have got 13 of the 17 bat species here. So you've got a huge, huge range of things that are really quite interesting and, and they've all basically come back to a landscape which has been rejuvenated for them. A lot of the fields started off looking roughly the same but in time, they seem to go in completely different directions in the way they evolve. As we go around, some areas are now really quite well wooded with, with shrubs and trees as they've evolved. Uh, other areas have ended up as preferential grazing areas for the animals, so they've ended up as grassy glades, as it were, and everything in between. So even in a relatively short space of time, you're seeing a natural kind of diversity of habitats evolving all for itself. Species like the purple emperor and, and the nightingale um, have, were classified as woodland birds, so if we'd wanted to go all out in a, in a very conventional way and conserve for these particular species, we might have planted woodland. But what we found is that actually they're coming back into habitats like this that are often unexpected. They, what the nightingales love is our growing out hedgerows. Um, the, the purple emperors are coming back because of our resurging sallow scrub. And so these are teaching us things about these species that we didn't know before, or at least we'd forgotten. 
because what we're observing a lot across Britain is that these species are clinging on by their fingernails in some instances to habitat that's not really suitable for them. And so now you get a resurgence of scrub at NEP and these species are responding in a way that no one expects at all. In ecology we call them emergent properties. What's happening, what's coming that we didn't expect, we didn't plan for it, we didn't manage it, we didn't uh, hope it would happen. Just celebrating what turns up. But you can't leave things totally alone because the whole of nature isn't here. In the dim distant past there would have been predators as well. You know, in, in a small patch of land in the southeast of England, and there is no room for these big apex predators. So you're having to control how many cattle, how many red deer, how many fallow deer, to give you the right mix of animals to give you some of the traits that you're wanting to follow. You're trying to control it as little as possible, but you are actually having some control. If you don't control the numbers, you then just end up with thousands and thousands of these animals. So you've got to take meat off the, off the project, and we sell that meat locally. We're not getting as much food here, obviously, if it was, as if it's productive agriculture. Some food is being produced, um, but other things are being produced as well. Uh, by re-naturalising the area, the odds are we're reducing the amount of water that flows off this land at a time of flood. So places lower, lower down the catchment are less likely to flood because of what's happening here. Soils are being rebuilt, so carbon is being locked up in the soils. So it's, it's a story about rebuilding ecosystems and doing it in a near natural way. You've got other benefits too, I mean just simple human enjoyment. We need these wild spaces, it's something we need from a very visceral deep place inside us. We need to know that these wild places are here. So obviously we're not doing this completely out of, sort of altruistic reasons. I mean, we love what we're doing. It's been a complete revelation, but it has to make financial sense. And one of the ways in which we can bring another income stream into the whole estate, the whole business, is through tourism. Micro-adventures is the new kind of buzzword. But this, this idea of being able to get access to genuine parts of nature that are on your doorstep. And so we have um, a safari business based really on a kind of African model. And we have a campsite and a glamping enterprise, so lovely shepherd's huts and yurts in the middle of the rewilding project. So you're listening to owls at night. You can go out and see bats. You can, you know, you're right in the thick of it. This is a sustainable business to have. The cash that comes in and stays in the bank account seems to be bigger and better than what it was when it was a commercial farm. And that's probably quite important for a lot of the private individuals that might be thinking of these things. What would be amazing in the future is if, if we could see this kind of project going on on marginal land that's not suitable for farming. You have this bigger chance for species to survive if little pockets like NEP are all joined up together with, with the great areas of wilderness that still exist. Conventional um, conservation is about preserving the little we've got left. You don't want to get rid of those conservation efforts, but what about adding to those conservation efforts? The NET project has given, I hope, lots of encouragement to lots of people to think bigger and to think out of the box. So one of the things that we hope that NET will achieve is to spearhead some of these changes of how we look at land and how we manage land for nature. I think the key to net success is really um, feeling that there is something exciting happening here, that, 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 that nature is teaching us something, rather than us always feeling that we are in control, that we are the masters of the universe. One of the extraordinary things about doing these sorts of process-led rewilding projects is that you are constantly, honestly learning the whole time. But one of the things you've got to learn to do is to sit on your hands. If a thistle grows in your backyard, don't touch it. If a patch of nettles comes up, don't touch it. It's that attitude that is very difficult for all of us to sit on our hands. And, and nature is not neat and tidy, it's very messy. And the messier it is in my book, the better it is. It's a wonderful feeling to, to, to wake up every morning and think, what surprise has NEP got in store for us today? What new species has popped up or refound us or recolonized us? Um, it's, it's an endless sort of journey of, of, of excitement and surprises. Mm -hmm.